Okay, okay, very good. Okay, so we are going to be looking at the Buddhist teaching of dependent origination. All right, now uh, we're going to be discussing this from the basis of the Pali texts, okay, primarily. And I'm going to begin by giving a little bit of background to make sure that we are all on the same page as to understanding what it is that the source that we're doing this is from. So can I begin by asking some questions? Is that all right? This is one thing the Buddha would do all the time. Tanking manya to bigawe. What do you think? Right? So I'm going to ask you some questions and see where we are at. So uh, what should I say? Okay, I'll, I'll, before I ask any questions, I'll just give a, a little bit of just general background. So on sort of central, we host uh, the Buddhist texts in the original languages and the translations. So by the original languages, we don't necessarily mean language spoken by the Buddha, but basically languages which have been preserved in the, Tripitaka, the ancient Tripitakas or the Buddhist traditions. Now, one of the things which we have discovered in modern times, it wasn't really necessarily understood that well before that, what we've discovered in modern times is that, that there are these different scriptural collections There are these different scriptural collections passed down in different Buddhist traditions. The main ones we have is the Pali tradition passed down in the Theravadan school, the uh, Chinese passed down in the Chinese school, and the t Tibetan passed down in, well I shouldn't say Chinese, but the Chinese which is passed down in the East Asian schools. Right? So China, Vietnam, Korea, Japan use the same Tripitaka. Uh, Tibetan canon passed down in the Central Asian schools, so Tibet, Bhutan, uh, Kashmir and so on. So, uh, not Kashmir, Sikkim, and so on. So, in addition to that, those three primary canons, then there is a, a kind of a miscellaneous collection of Sanskrit suttas, which are kind of recovered more or less randomly from a jar in the desert or some forgotten shelf on a Tibetan monastery library where it was stuck a thousand years ago and no one's opened it since then, uh, and so on. So we don't have like a complete Buddhist canon in Sanskrit, but we have fairly substantial uh, remnants and, and a few bits and pieces in other languages, Gandhari, Dokarian, uh, and so on. So of all of those scriptures, which are very big, right? If you've been to Buddhist temples, you'll see they have whole, that this uh, in Berkeley, they have the, what do they call it? The Dhamma College in Berkeley, and they have this big hall, and they have these massive things with all of these books in them. So these scriptures are all very big. Uh, and they include writings and reflections and so on on Dhamma and various aspects of Dhamma for the last two and a half thousand years. So it's a continuous Buddhist tradition. So, so the Buddhist collections often are more like, it's more like a Buddhist library than it is like, say, you think of like, say, a Bible or something like that. Theravada tradition is a bit different because they remain, they keep the, um, the, the canon distinct from commentaries, but then Anyway, I don't want to go too much into the thing, but out of all of that, there are a certain strata of texts which are more or less common to all of those traditions. And those texts have a lot of signs and features about them which indicate that they underlie all of those other teachings. In other words, that when anybody was writing those other teachings, that they already knew those things in that text, right? So they, they were responding to them or explaining them or discussing different points in them and so on. And those texts are what we call, generically we can call the early Buddhist texts. In terms of uh, Buddhist doctrine, then usually just the suttas, okay? And so this is that sort of general class of literature which is shared among all the Buddhist traditions and is foundational to all the Buddhist traditions and which I believe that there are good uh, historical reasons for thinking that they go back to the Buddha himself and were as compiled and edited by the early Buddhist community. And they were then passed down and distributed uh, across the whole Buddhist world. So that's just a brief summary of the basis for the, the scriptural basis, if you like, that we uh, use when we're trying to understand what is the Dhamma, what is the, that the Buddha taught.
Now, of course, scripture is just scripture. It's just words, right? So don't, you know, don't misunderstand me and don't mistake me, right? I run a website for suttas. So obviously I love the suttas and all of these kinds of things. But at the end of the day, it's just some words. And <laughs> that's it. So don't think that somehow, you know, if you, your most important thing always is your experience and your practice and being free. And I love the suttas because they speak to me about my experience and they help to me to understand my life. And I think they do the same for others as well. And they help lead me from darkness into light, from suffering to happiness, you know, from chains to, to freedom. And to me, this is what's really important about the suttas. Understanding these the suttas means that we have a context and a framework for seeing in perspective all of the different Buddhist teachings and traditions. Right? So don't, don't fall into a sort of trap of being fundamentalist, like only things in the suttas are right and everything else is wrong. That's not what it's about. Actually, all of the Buddhist teachings and traditions are about what do Buddhists like you and me do when you try to live this stuff, you hear these teachings and you, how do you make sense of it? How do you share it? How do you respond to it? And that's what the living Buddhist traditions are and that's what we're doing. And so I see us as very much participating in that you know, community which has been going on for two and a half thousand years. And we're responding to that in our own particular way. And we'll find some answers, perhaps, that are going to be useful for us in this time and place. Uh, and another generation will look at it and they'll, they'll find something else. So today we're going to look at this very core teaching of the Buddha, Dependent Origination. And the whole point of Dependent Origination is about context and conditionality and all of these kinds of things. Now, my guess is you've probably taught Dependent Origination here before, is that correct? Somebody here said they've went to a course by Bhikkhu Bodhi on Dependent Origination, is that correct? Yes, yes excellent. So that's like really like super intimidating for me. So anyway, <laughs> I never let that stop me before. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say a bunch of stuff about dependent origination, which hopefully will make sense. Dependent origination is a notoriously complex and difficult teaching. After the Buddha became enlightened, then he said. What's the point in teaching all of these idiots? It's like one of the most relatable things that he ever said. Right? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, what's the point, right? I'm like, dude, I hear you. <laughs> and he said the things that they will find very hard to understand. And he mentioned specifically two things that people will find hard to understand. One is dependent origination and number two is Nibbana. Yeah? And I think we can agree that, you know, it's still often the case today that these are two teachings that people struggle with. Yeah? And they're very because they're very subtle things. So don't see this as a like a today as like a course or a workshop where you're going to get the answers to what dependent origination is. All right. I would be if somebody comes up to me at the end of the day and says, before today, I knew nothing about dependent origination. And now I feel I know negative about dependent origination. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've like extracted information from my brain about dependent origination. Then that would make me so happy. Yeah? I would feel really kind of joyful about that because a vacuum and emptiness that's where the knowledge is going to come from. And if you realize, as would have said in the Dhammapada, a fool who knows he's a fool is wise at least to that extent. Yeah? So if you're doing this and at the end of a day long like this, you think I still haven't got a clue what's going on, fine. That's, that's not a bad outcome at all. all right? But at least we might be able to pick up one or two things that's useful. Again, for, for people coming late, please, please do come around here so you can see the screen. Please, please come. We're going to be using the screen. Please come. Bring your chairs over. Don't feel ostracized. Don't feel like a pariah. Unlike these, these guys, we, these guys are pariah. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm sorry. I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> 
Yeah. And and you can move forward a little bit. Yeah, move forward. Everyone squeeze in. We're all friends here. good everyone settled so yes yeah, so I'm going to teach something about dependent origination I will spend a little bit of time on some like basic facts and definitions and so we can have some conceptual clarity on that and I will raise but I won't try to do everything like really comprehensively because that would mean just talking really fast and being incomprehensible so I will try rather to bring up a few aspects, a few ways of looking at things that might be stimulating and might be interesting. Uh, and I think that uh, one of the things that's to me is really interesting about dependent origination is that, um, you know, in, in essence, actually, it's quite a simple presentation, but it uh, it, it has so many ramifications and so many implications in different areas. And so it's been extremely fertile in both Buddhist philosophy and also contemporary philosophy that the ideas and principles behind dependent origination can be taken up and applied in so many different contexts. Right? And so we're going to learn something about those different contexts uh, and these kinds of things. Now one of the things that uh, dependent origination teaches us it's the basic idea of course is we're teaching about relationship about connection about conditions and about something conditions something else okay and the basic formula of dependent origination I'll see if I've actually got that up here uh, might not actually have that pulled up and the basic basic it uh, Right, so here's the itapachayata, this being so, that is. From the arising of this, that arises. This not being so, that is not. From the ceasing of this, that ceases. Okay, so it's a, a principle of conditionality, that certain things depend on certain other things. Now the Buddha was applying that in a specific context, and the specific context that he's talking about is the context of freedom how to get free from suffering. Right? But the same principles apply in all walks of life. Now what I want to do now is I want to begin by doing an, an exercise. Can we begin by doing a, a, an exercise? Well, okay, and I want you to get to know each other. I want you to walk over to the other side of the room, introduce yourself to somebody who you don't know, and I want you two to talk to each other and find something, find some way on which you depend on that other person. Maybe that person is a software programmer and they've used a piece of software that you've written or been associated with. Maybe, maybe that person is a chef and you've eaten food before. <laughs> right? Maybe they are an accountant and you're like, oh yeah, I need accountants. Right? So find some way in which we can find some connection where either directly or indirectly right, there, is some, there is some connection between you. Can we do that? Okay, let's do that. And just watch out for this cable on the floor to trip over that because you'll be independently conditioned on the floor. Thank you. 
keep them safe and make sure that the parts are down so we can continue to stay safe in our housing fire and the we have to do. the question was there anybody in this room who found somebody that they would never met before a stranger they never met before and that they had no connection and nothing in common with was anyone who found that no, no interesting right so uh, so this is this idea of connection of conditionality there's a relationship between things I'll give a bit of a historical background here before starting with what the Buddha was teaching. Why, what, one of the questions which often we don't ask is why was the Buddha uh, emphasizing this so much? Uh, why did the Buddha make such a big deal about teaching cause and effect? Mm. 
right? And of course, the Buddha was teaching two and a half thousand years ago. And the philosophical climate, the cultural climate, and all of these kinds of things was very different. Uh, and uh, they didn't have a, like a scientific culture and all of these kinds of things that we have today. Uh, of course, there was, uh, in many ways, a very advanced uh, philosophical, linguistic, cultural uh, context. Uh, but also, there's a lot of um, uh, perhaps superstition, uh, black magics, a lot of uh, people doing all kinds of weird stuff, right? Astrology or, you know, a lot of kind of fortune telling and all of these kinds of things. Of course, we still have all that stuff today, right? It's not as if that's gone away. So one of, the Buddha, one of the things that the Buddha was trying to point to was try to say that, well, we can observe what the patterns are in nature. And we can learn from that. This is, this is really important. This is what this idea, this being so, that is, from the arising of this, that is. So we're observing the patterns in nature, either external nature or in our own nature. And we can start to recognize regular patterns of how these things are connected. And, if, and of course, that, so, that, that sounds like very kind of obvious, right? I mean, maybe in the winter time or something, it rains. And so, you know, there's a time during the year when you want to plant your garden and time of year when you don't want to plant your garden. And there's these, these, these patterns that we can observe in nature. But often those patterns aren't necessarily, or that natural way of thinking is not obviously how we do things in a religious context or a spiritual context. And in fact, very often when people come to a spiritual context, they seem to want to do things a completely different way. So instead of relying on anything which we might think of as normal cause and effect, we just rely on someone's going to come and save us. Right? And of course, the nice uh, joke about that was uh, the man who was in the flood. It was a well-known one. Probably, everyone's probably heard this. The guy in the flood. The rescue boat comes to rescue him. He says, no, Jesus will save me. You know this joke? Yeah. Yeah, it's a very common one. Uh, I won't bother telling it again. Anyway, so then he goes up to the... You, you never heard it? No. So he sends a, the rescue boat comes. He says, don't worry, God will save me. And then the helicopter comes. He says, don't worry, take someone else. God will save me. I have faith. And then he drowns and he dies and he goes to heaven. And he says to God, why didn't you save me? God said, well, first I sent a rescue boat. <laughs> 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 then I sent a helicopter. And, uh, yeah. So what the Buddha is concerned to do is to embed his uh, spiritual path, his, his path, his understanding of the world and the, our, our problem that we have in the world, the way to get out of the world, to embed this in the same kind of naturalistic principles with which we can understand nature generally. All right? So there's a continuity. In another way of saying this is that the Buddha was opposed to metaphysics. When I'm using the word metaphysics here, I'm using it in a specific philosophical sense. Uh, and this particular usage is something that I learned from David Kalapahana, who's a very great Buddhist philosopher uh, until recently at the University of Hawaii. Uh, and for Kalapahana, he used the word metaphysics in the sense of something that uh, is intrinsically of a different order to the things that we find in nature. Okay. Now, the word metaphysics comes from Aristotle and the the, one of the, the great paradigms of this idea of metaphysics is to consider the stars right? and the heavenly bodies. So if we, we're down here on Earth, everything seems, everything has these characteristics, like everything on Earth is messy, everything's unpredictable, everything changes, everything's all of this kind of stuff. But then when we look in the heavens, it's kind of not like that. The stars are beautiful and pristine and eternal and they stay the same way and critically they don't fall out of the sky so the stars seem to follow a completely different order of nature to what we find here on the earth and it's not obvious how how, how can it be that tables and chairs and people and elephants will fall but stars don't Right, well, obviously, the obvious answer to that is, well, the gravity works differently down here than it does up there. There's one set of laws of nature down here and another set up here. Here, everything is impermanent. Here, everything changes. Here, everything's messy and conditioned. But up there, everything's eternal and pristine and pure. Right? And this is not a 
it's not obviously wrong, right? I mean, it, 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 I mean it's, it's an over, you know, the sun rises in the sky. And we can see this imagery being used by the Buddha uh, when he's talking about dependent origination. And I think he's using this kind of imagery quite consciously when the nature of things becomes really manifest to the ardent meditating Brahman. By Brahman, he means perfected one. He d dwells dispelling Mara's army as the sun dwells lighting up the sky. And I don't think the Buddha is like invoking this imagery accidentally. So all of these things, this, this uh, idea of the celestial realm being a different order of nature following different rules. Right? So the Buddha is a naturalistic person teacher and he says no actually everything follows the same rules much like say in western science a great breakthrough in western science when Galileo comes along and Newton come along and they say no actually we can explain the stars and the motion of the stars and the moon and the sun by actually understanding better the way that gravity works here and now right that's what they did they looked how does gravity work here and now look at it really closely then look at the stars look at them really closely you see actually they're following the same laws so this is how we have this naturalistic idea of science. This is the same kind of understanding in dependent origination, that by looking more closely and understanding what is going on here and now, we can then understand the big picture better. All right? And dependent origination is giving that big picture. How, how do we get born? Where do we come from? What is the meaning of life? Do we get reborn? Where do we go? Where do we come from? All of these kinds of things. These things are all contained in and revealed through understanding the present. Okay? Everyone with me? No. <laughs> Please ask if, if any, anything I say is uh, unclear or wrong or whatever, then just, just ask. Please, yes, thank you. That's correct, yes. Yeah, how suffering comes into being and how suffering ends. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cheers. Thank you. Close by. All right, very good. So let's have a quick look now at the. Oh, oh, oh sorry, I'll just give you a, a bit of a rundown of the context as well. So now I mentioned before earlier that that these core teachings we call the early Buddhist teachings are found across across the different traditions now one of the things that we find when we look at all of those different traditions is we find that of course there are variations and changes from one text to another and so on and so forth it's not completely identical however we find that when it comes to the central doctrinal teachings that there's an almost absolute level of consistency across all the different traditions. Yes, of, of course there are variations in different places, but something like dependent origination, which has 12 links, they are, they are identical all the time, whether it's Pali, Sanskrit, Tibetan or Chinese, is always presented in exactly the same way. So uh, these are the things which the tradition was memorizing and uh, which, which they believed were the real core to the Buddha's teachings. So how that works, and how that works especially in, in that ancient Indian culture, was that you basically have a, a short formula which you would memorize and which everybody would know of by heart, and then you have all of these different elaborations and explanations of it. So all those different elaborations and explanations depend on your understanding the basic context and meaning of those, that core formula. All right, that's how it works. So it's, a bit, it's very much unlike the way that we present uh, information today, where you have like a treatise or a textbook, where you sort of explain something sequentially through the whole thing, or you try to give one systematic exposition of it. So it's much more like you have like a, a core definition here, and then you have like little bits and pieces everywhere that's shedding uh, a bit of light on it. Okay, so, so the, the way that we learn and grow in these things is much more organic. So you pick up a bit of information here, a bit of information there, it doesn't make sense, and then something happens and you see, oh yeah, that's what they were talking about. And then gradually the links and connections come up. So let's have a look to begin with 
uh, at the initial statement on dependent origination. So I'm going to be here reading from, uh, we'll be reading from the Pali texts because, well, honestly, mainly because I know Pali, so that helps. And these are translations, my translations of the Pali text, and I use my translations because obviously. And, <laughs> uh, and we have the Pali here together with the, uh, 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 with the English translation. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm guessing most of you here have some familiarity with the suttas before. Right? Is that correct? Is there anyone here who's that, is that completely new to suttas and things like that? Thank you so much for telling me. Good. Do you, do you, are you following what's going on? <laughs> yeah? Please tell me. T tell me if there's anything, okay? Don't feel shy to ask because otherwise I feel like an idiot. <laughs> right? So this is, this is a sutta. So when we talk about suttas, this is a sutta. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> and there's there's lots of them right so that means you never need to run out well you do run out after a while I stayed on an island in Taiwan for two and a half years translating suttas and then I sort of ran out and I'm like no oh, wish there were more <laughs> so the suttas in principle all start with a similar kind of uh, presentation a formula although in, in practice often that gets abbreviated so it begins with the words, thus have I heard. And the reason it says, so have I heard, is because this, is a, this was originally an oral tradition. So these scriptures were passed down in oral tradition. They were memorized and passed down. And so, so I've heard. One time the Buddha was staying in, near Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anattapindika's monastery. Uh, Savati being a city in northern India, uh, just north of the uh, Ganges in modern day Uttar Pradesh, I believe. There the Buddha addressed the mendicants. Mendicants, venerable sir, they replied. And the Buddha said this. So we can see that this is a teaching given in a particular time and place to a particular group of people. This introduction is a very generic one and we find it in lots of texts, but there are also many discourses that are much more specific, like a particular discussion between the Buddha and one person or between students and other people. But lacking any more specific context, the more general suttas, we just have that generic uh, wrapping. Uh, which bookends the uh, sutta. Okay, mendicants, I will teach you dependent origination. Paticca samuppadang wo bhikkhwe dese sami. Listen and pay, pay close attention, I will speak. Yes, sir, they replied. The Buddha said this. So, without going kind of too much into the detail, but it's interesting that this is a, the kind of framing of it is the Buddha has to first get the attention of the, the, the monks and nuns. So we use the word mendicant as a um, uh, gender-neutral translation, and the, but it generally refers to monks and nuns who, would, who may or been present at the time. Uh, but I kind of feel like they're. I, I kind of feel like if the Buddha's sitting, if the Buddha is sitting up there, about to give a talk, and like everyone's sitting there chatting and like, blah, 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 I feel like you kind of would be paying attention anyway, right? I don't know, but maybe not, right? Because the Buddha has to keep on saying, come on, pay attention now. Everyone shut up. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Anyway, so what is dependent origination? And so the Buddha then goes on to teach the basic uh, series of 12 factors. A little bit earlier, we read the general formula. This being that is, this arises, that arises. This not being, that is not, that ceases, that ceases. And so here is like the specific application of what is it that's arising and ceasing. Ignorance is a condition for choices. Choices are a condition for consciousness. Consciousness is a condition for name and form. Name and form are conditions for the six sense fields. The six sense fields are conditions for contact. Contact is a condition for feeling. Feeling is a condition for craving. Craving is a condition for grasping. Grasping is a condition for continued existence. Continued existence is a condition for rebirth. Rebirth is a condition for old age and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness and distress to come to be. That is how this entire mass of suffering originates. This is called dependent origination. When ignorance fades away and ceases with nothing left over, choices cease. When choices cease, consciousness ceases. When consciousness ceases, name and form cease. When name and form cease, the six sense fields cease. When the six sense fields cease, contact ceases. 
When contact ceases, feeling ceases. When feeling ceases, craving ceases. When craving ceases, grasping ceases. When grasping ceases, continued existence ceases. When continued existence ceases, rebirth ceases. When rebirth ceases, old age and death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, sadness and distress cease. That is how this entire mass of suffering ceases. That's what the Buddha said. Satisfied, the monks, were, the mendicants were happy with what the Buddha said. Okay, so this is the first um, discourse in the collection of discourses dealing with dependent origination, the Sangyutta Nikaya. And as you can see, it gives a very straight, generic summary of the teaching. Okay, so in other places, in the other discourses, it'll give different aspects and, and so on of that. So we'll go on to uh, discuss the specific terms here in just a minute. But before we do that, are there any questions about that sutta? I mean, there's many questions and things that's raised, but is there anything specifically about that sutta? Uh, not particularly the definitions of terms, because we're going to go into that in a minute. But apart from that, is there anything, questions? Yeah. So, dependent origination is consciousness relying on, on limitation? Right. Is that what, sorry? If you don't have mortality, you can't have enlightenment, <coughs> you think? Absolutely, right? Yeah. But if you don't have suffering to overcome, right. it's hard to understand when you don't have enlightenment, is what I mean. And so right. It's dependent upon, on, on, on that. Um, That's okay, that's okay. But yeah, you're right. The, the, that without that suffering, then we can't find the freedom. If, if the question might occur to you later on, or you might you know, be, 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 ask again if you're, if you're not sure what, what you want to ask right now. Yeah. When you get to choices, um, I'd love to hear how you made that translation decision, because I feel mm -hmm. like that's very specific to, right? to yours. Like I've, it is, I've yeah. I've seen it yeah. a lot of other things, like what nations of fabrication Right. Um, and so many of your choices and other students are very straightforward and modern, and I right. enjoy that. Mm. So I'd just love to hear how you came to that selection of that word. Okay, we will do so. We actually discussed this a little bit uh, yesterday because we discussed the five aggregates yesterday and it has the same word sankara in it. Um, but anyway, yes, absolutely, that will be that will be in the thing. Any anyone else before we go on? Yes. I just mentioned, can you make at some point the linkages between five aggregates and dependent origination? Okay, so the linkages between if I make the linkages between the five aggregates and dependent origination, I will end up with the abhidhamma. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll see how we go for time. Yeah, but I mean, obviously, some of the same terms appear. So the, the different the different teachings in Buddhism are not meant to be exclusive, and they're not meant to be um, like one of I mentioned the Abhidhamma. So you probably have you heard of the Abhidhamma before? Any idea? Sorry. Yesterday. Yesterday. All <laughs> oh, right. Okay. So one of the, the Abhidhamma is the, the sort of latest scholastic texts, and one of the main things that they do is precisely that. They precisely answer, well, how does this teaching relate to that teaching, right? The Buddha here talked about this, and there he talked about that, and what do they have to do with each other? And so the, the, in the suttas, it doesn't necessarily make those connections, and so later generations of scholars came along and showed what they thought were the connections between all of those things. Now, obviously, you can see that in the case of the... Uh, khandas, that many of the terms are similar here, right? You have the vinyana as consciousness and sankharas, and you have vedana and so on. Uh, and then they may or may not be used in exactly the same sense, right? But it's being implied in a somewhat different context, right? So the, the khandas or the aggregates being more of a structural context, and this being very much explicitly a, a, a process and an evolution. Yeah. Um, and I should just briefly mention, we're going to run out of time very soon, but briefly mention that 
Um, because this is a verbal formula, right? As a verbal formula, words go in lines, right? They tend to, you, you, one word goes after another. Uh, but in the Buddhist traditions, have traditionally seen this in a cyclical way. Yeah? And if you see, you're, you're probably familiar with the very famous Tibetan de depiction of the, the wheel of life, the Bhava Chakra, where these, these 12 are depicted in a cycle. So, we're, so these are all just metaphors, all right? These are metaphors that capture something about that process. So I'm not saying it is a wheel or it is a line. I'm saying that there is something which is complicated and which is expressed in these different ways. So don't mistake the expression for the thing that's being talked about. Right? So there's plenty of, way, plenty of places in the suttas where the Buddha shows complexities and nuances and changes and so on to this formula. Right? So it's not just this one thing. Okay, uh, you said we break a bit before eleven. You'll give me the you'll give me the word when we have to break, right? Um, maybe in five, minutes. five minutes. Okay. <laughs> oh. Okay. So what I'll do is I won't go and read the definitions of them right now because that would take more than five minutes. But what I'm going to do is going to read something which is going to make us think of it maybe a different way. This is from the Mahatanha Sankhya Sutta. Mendicants, when three things come together, an embryo is conceived. In the case when the mother and father come together, but the mother is not in the fertile part of a menstrual cycle, the spirit being reborn is not present and the embryo is not conceived. In a case where the mother and father come together, the mother is in the fertile part of her menstrual cycle, but the spirit being reborn is not present, the embryo is not conceived. But when these three things come together, the mother and father come together, the mother is in the fertile part of her menstrual cycle and the spirit being reborn is present and embryo is conceived. The mother nurtures the embryo in her womb for nine or ten months at great risk to her heavy burden. When nine or month, ten months have passed, the mother gives birth at great risk to a heavy burden. When the infant is born, she nourishes it with her own blood, for mother's milk is regarded as blood in the training of the noble one. That boy grows up and his faculties mature. He accordingly plays childish games such as toy plows, tip cats, somersaults, pinwheels, toy measures, toy carts, and toy bows. And translating that passage is probably the hardest one to translate. Uh, the boy grows up and his faculties mature further. He accordingly amuses himself, supplied and provided with the five kinds of sensual stimulation. Sights known by the eye that are likable, desirable, agreeable, pleasant, sensual, and arousing. S sounds known by the ear, smells known by the nose, tastes known by the tongue. Touches known by the body that are likable, desirable, agreeable, pleasant, sensual, and arousing. When they see a sight with their eyes, if it's pleasant, they desire it. If it's unpleasant, they dislike it. They live with mindfulness of the body unestablished and their heart restricted. And they don't truly understand the freedom of heart and freedom by wisdom where those arisen, bad, unskillful qualities cease without anything left over. Being full, so full of favoring and opposing, when they experience any kind of feeling, pleasant, unpleasant or neutral, they approve, welcome, and keep clinging to it. This gives rise to relishing. Relishing feelings is grasping. Their grasping is a condition for continued existence. Continued existence is a condition for rebirth. Rebirth is a condition for old age and death, sorrow, lamentation, sadness, and distress to come to be. That is how this entire mass of suffering originates. Right? So here we have a presentation of dependent origination and goes through the different kind of senses and so on. Here we have a presentation of dependent origination that begins with physical conception, right? And I think it's really important to remember this. I mean, this is probably one of the, if not the, earliest depictions of the child's development process anywhere in, world's, in world literature, right? Any psychologists or psychiatrists here? Right? This, I, I'm not aware of anything earlier than this. It's actually talking about as the child's developing. I mean, it's only simple, right? It's only giving us a few tips. But it's pointing out that this condition is about the life, right? It's about life. It's about what happens to us when we live and when kids live and when we grow up and how we evolve as people. So when we see that bare list of categories we saw first, right? Ignorance, conditions, choices, and so on. It seems very abstract, right? Kind of bloodless, yeah? This is, well, literally bloody, right? And 
it's 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 embedded in the embodied experience of human beings and how they live their life what kinds of choices and what experiences that we have as human beings and about how we make the choices that lead to our suffering or as it will go on to say <laughs> we can make different choices and lead to the freedom from suffering yeah so this is in the mahatanha sankhya sutta which is one of the most interesting and um uh, lengthy expositions on dependent origination found in the canon. I'm not going to discuss all of this in detail. I'm sure there's many questions and interesting points in there, but I just want to throw it out so that you can get some kind of sense for that living context that the Buddha was teaching in. Yeah. Time. Thank you, Venerable. We're going to have a break and have something to eat. Let us go and conditionally nourish our bodies.